Greetings students, welcome again to yet another series of insurance law. Last class we learned about what is insurable interest and before that we learned about what is insurance in the legal perspective. We learned about the parties to insurance. We just went through a little bit of what is the insurance contract. We learned about um, you know, what is insurable interest and also the uh, certain laws that are prevalent in different jurisdictions of the world. Uh, today we will move further and understand the concept of insurable risk or rather the type of risks that the insurance companies are willing to cover. What is the definition of this insurable risk? Who are the parties in the insurable uh, or in the insurance contract like the insured and the, the insurer? So let's move on further to our slides. If you have any questions, you can ask me at the end of this class, or if there is something that you really want to know during the course of this class, so uh, you can just raise your hands and then I will uh, get back to you on whatever question that you want to uh, you know, ask me and I will sort, sort it out. So what is this insurable risk? We all understand what is a risk. So in the insurance perspective, a risk that is capable of being insured or covered under a valid insurance policy could be termed as an insurable risk. Thereby, the risk in question needs to conform to the criteria and stipulations of the insurance policy. We need to understand here is that any insurance company would not be willing to cover any risk that would cause them a loss. Having understood the meaning of insurance, the purpose of insurance uh, during the first class, the very first class, and this being the fourth class, that is a lecture four. I remember teaching you in lecture one, what is the purpose of this insurance and what happens uh, you know, uh, in the insurance sector and how does uh, the resources actually rotate and how they pool the resources from the society and how they disperse it to the one in need at the right time, probably when the policy matures or when there is any loss or damage that is caused and the insurance company has to uh, you know, indemnify the loss. Talking about insurable risk, you would find this under the scope clause of the insurance contract. That is in the terms and conditions, you would find a clause called as an insurance clause. This is actually the heart of the insurance uh, policy contract, which defines the scope of uh, you know, the insurance policy, where they would really adumbrate the type of risks that would be covered. Now, a risk may not be considered as insurable. So risks, you can actually bifurcate it uh, as you know, insurable risk and uninsurable risk or non-insurable risk. Like example of insurable risk is, of course, life. You know about life insurance, property. You know about property insurance or vehicle or motor vehicle insurance. And what is uninsurable is, for example, risks that are not pure in nature. They cannot be, you know, or pure, direct, or it is not even interpretatively direct. It is not pure in nature in the insurance parlance. It's not a pure risk. Uh, for example, like windfall gains, lottery, or gambling. These are examples of uninsurable risk. So a risk may not be considered as insurable if it is incalculable, that is a company cannot really calculate it. It is inestimable and incapable of being ascertained or defined. Again, I'm giving you the example here as loss is to be covered as a result of war. Next is the characteristics of the elements of insurable risk. The first element that would be present uh, it for determining whether the risk is insurable or not by the underwriters is they would see whether the risk is a pure risk and not a suppositional or you know imaginary or speculative risk. Example again of speculative risk is something that depends on the market rise or market fall and financially speculative risk depending on the markets. 
that's another example for you. And I've reiterated the example of windfall gain or gambling that cannot be insured because they are not pure risks, but they are suppositional in nature or speculative. Next is determinable loss. What is determinable loss? That which can be determined, that which can be calculated and defined. So the loss must be determinable, measurable, and capable of being calculated. Next is the loss must be decipherable as an unintentional loss, that is, which is not actually, uh, you know, a planned loss, because a planned loss would attract other legal provisions, which is not permitted, permitted under the law. Intentional loss is not permitted under the law where a person would, you know, uh, calculatively, uh, you know, calculatively a person would, uh, you know, design a damage and then claim, uh, you know, from the insurance company or from the insurer. There are many cases uh, like which are still pending in the courts and there are many cases where the parties or uh, you know the insured or even the beneficiaries create a loss or you know they try to uh, you know design uh, intentional loss and then try to claim from the insurance company so the underwriters are well, quite smart enough they would ask you for you know they would ask the insured for certain documents that are evidence that the loss has occurred and certain reports, for example, there is an accident, so they would ask for the police report. So the loss must be deciphered as an unintentional loss and it shouldn't be a planned loss. However, it may be accidental, but again here it has to be proved through various evidence and for example is of course the police report. Next is with major. With major in law means act of God. An act of God example for you is something that is beyond, you know, human control. Like, for example, floods, rain, storm, tornadoes, earthquake. So these examples of this where property is destroyed or this mass destruction as a result of this major or act of God. These are also called as a fundamental risk or rather they come under the category of fundamental risk in insurance parlance and they may be excluded entirely or restricted or limited under standard insurance because standard insurance policies normally will not cover a risk major or they might restrict or limit the coverage however it depends upon the the policy itself and also it depends upon the internal policies of the insurer or the insurance company so thereby the law should not come within the purview of cataclysmic or catastrophic losses. However, force major, now force major is another term here, uh, I mean, normally used in contracts. Force major uh, normally used in commercial contracts. So force major insurance may be sought in case of projects and the coverage may be limited and may be placed as political risk. Coverage, especially if contractors are spread across different countries. Next is capable of leaning on actuarial sciences. So the underwriters would check for, the underwriters of the insurer would check for whether a particular risk that is sought to be covered is capable of leaning on actuarial sciences. That is, what is actuarial science is actually a statistical and a mathematical method of assessing financial risks. There is probability analysis here with statistics. It is used in order to ascertain, analyze, or advise solutions to adverse financial impact that any uncertain event would cause that is or not foreseen. But thereby, actual science aids insurance companies in interpretatively predicting or forecasting the probability of an event and the need of fund dispersal should the event occur. Next is the probability of loss must be calculable. Next is premiums must be economically feasible. That is premiums that they normally design for a particular insurance policy should be economically feasible and you know, reasonable enough that the insured is capable of paying. Next is insurable risk and uninsurable risks. Now having noted the elements of insurable risk, it can be said that risks that exhibit 
the five elements expressed about whatever we discussed now are insurable risk that is capable of being determined, calculable, and so on. So thereby, insurable risk is a risk that is capable of being insured. So what is insurable risk in simple terms that is capable of being insured? But what is capable of being insured is the five elements that we've already discussed just some time back, that is now. That it, and the element of measurability, calculability, what we discussed, uh, you know, probability, and that which leans on actual science with economically feasible premiums can be referred to as insurable risk. Example, pure risk, property risk, personal risk. These are examples of pure risk. Liability risk are the types of insurable risks and that are direct in nature. Next is non-insurable risk. Non-insurable risks are risks that cannot be insured. They also call as uninsurable risk since they are indeterminable, incalculable, improbable, and may involve the element of speculation. So they're also referred to as uninsurable, just as I said. An example of this is again, windfall gain, lottery, gambling, pandemic risk, risk reputational risk, political risk. Now, insurance company, companies do not cover such risk to reduce their liability and losses and that the insurance is all about pooling resources and disbursing to the claimants at the time of legitimate need or at the end of the policy. Now, what are the types of risks that may or may not be insurable? Broadly, risks that may be insurable or uninsurable can be categorized as follows. One is calculable risk, that is pure risk, which is insurable, speculative risk, which is uninsurable, fundamental risk, that is example, which major act of God, which you already discussed, like earthquake, flood, storm, tornado, force. And then we have force major, that is like war, epidemic, again, pandemic, including which major, etc. So such risks affect a large group of people or area may or may not be insurable or may be limited. Now, next is static risks. Static risks are risks that are untainted and clear. Probable risk, that is, which is possible of being, uh, you know, foreseen. Example, risk of theft, risk of accident. What I mean by Enforcing is something which a person would apprehend. Like normally, theft can be, you know, a person might be threatened of, you know, theft. For example, you would not just keep your, uh, you know, precious items just open. You would not keep your the doors of your house open. So these are something that is, you know, can be apprehended. So they are probable risks. So this comes within the ambit of static risk, that is theft or accidents. So these kind of risks are insurable. Next is dynamic risk. Dynamic risks are risks, risks that are subject to the changes in the economy. Since such a risk is speculative in nature with a possible outcome of either gain, loss, or break even. Now, it is not insurable and thereby is an uninsurable risk. Example, market changes, inflation risk, political risk, reinvestment risk, and so on. Next is the insured. Who is the insured? You already have a general idea of who is the insured, but let us check theoretically now who is the insured. Now, insured refers to people or group of people where individuals or corporate who holds or is covered under an insurance policy. The insurer or the insured can also be called as the insurance policy holder. Now, Cambridge English Dictionary defines insured as a person, group of people, or organization that is insured in a particular agreement. West Encyclopedia of American Law defines insured as the person who obtains or is otherwise covered by insurance on his or her health, life, or property. So the insured in a policy is not limited to the insured name in the policy, but applies to anyone who is insured under the policy. This is one West Encyclopedia of American Law defined the insured. Now, it is the insurance contract, as we just said earlier, that clearly specifies the parties in the insurance policy contract, that is the insurer, the insured, the policyholder, and the beneficiaries. And on the other hand, the insurance clause 
in an insurance contract is the heart of the insurance policy contract that sets out the details and the scope of insurance. Now, what are the duties of the insurer? I've taken this from uh, Insurance Opedia because, uh, I mean, it's a relevant source of information there. So Insurance Opedia uh, has elucidated the duties of insured as follows as what you can see on the screen. One is to disclose material information that is, uh, you know, not disclosing material in, uh, mat uh, material information would amount to rescinding the insurance contract or even non disbursal of the claim amount. So all material information has to be disclosed to the insurance company. Next is avoid concealment and misrepresentation. That is again, avoid concealing or hiding of facts and do not misrepresent. That is, the insured is not expected to misrepresent by faking documents. Next is report loss or damage to the authorities in case there is a loss or damage to the insured property, immediately report the loss or damage to the authority. Next is provide notice of claim to the insurer. Next is prepare an inventory of the damage or stolen property and provide proof of loss to the insurer. Now this proof of loss, you know, comes in the form of, uh, the, you know, various reports that may be evidence that as I said, for example, accidents, that could be evidence from a police report. Now, next is the inability of the insurer to comply with the duties is a ground for breach of contract, cancellation of, of policy, and the full feature of premiums paid. That means the insurance company would, uh, you know, uh, would not disburse the claim and uh, they would forfeit the 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 earlier premiums that were paid, that means they would not give you back the amount that is already paid as premiums to them and directly go ahead and cancel the policy. However, now the three primary duties of the insured are one duty to disclose information, that is all kind of information pertaining to the property, for example, any risks that may be involved and any risk that uh, may be transferred to the to the insurer has to be revealed and failure to disclose such information would amount to breach and also thereby would be, you know, uh, the person may end up, the insurer may end up losing the insurance coverage. Next is duty to cooperate by revealing again all information that is required, pertinent information, pertinent documents, ID documents and so on to cooperate and whenever there is a claim to reveal all information, to submit all reports on time. So this is the duty to cooperate, uh, you know, uh, what is expected of a good insured or, a, you know, the, the person who is insured or the policy holder. Next is the duty to pay regular premiums. Premiums now vary based on the type of insurance coverage, the age of the insured, the jurisdictional area, the place, and the past record of the insured claims. If any, however, if the insured fails to pay the premium as mentioned in the insurance contract, then the policy would be rendered invalid and may even, be st even stand canceled. Now, while we understand that the insured purchases a, an insurance policy, we have understood that, to safeguard against harm, losses, or damages that may be caused as a result of an event, and that the insured pays for the policy and contracts to pay regular premium in anticipation of being compensated or indemnified of any losses that may occur that they have sought to be protected. So here, the purpose of insurance for the insured is indemnification should there be any loss and to that end the the insured goes ahead and pays premium as demanded by the insurer now for exams you might get a question saying that not all claimants can be considered as insured elaborate or not all claimants can be considered as insured uh, comment so for that, you will have to tell me who is the insured, what is the role of the insurance contract there, what is the insurable risk, and just, you know, then go in detail about why you say that all claimants, you know, cannot be considered as insured. So that we will learn now. 
Some claimants may be policy holders. Listen carefully. Some claimants may be policy holders as the one who actually invests in the insurance policy. And the insured, they may also be the insured. While some may be insured under an insurance scheme of the policy holder by virtue of which they may be considered as claimants and not insured. Like for example, say company X purchases a general liability insurance. Then they have this driver whose name is Mr. Y. He inadvertently bumps into the toolkit that belonged to one of the external handmen, by, that Mr. Z, for the company. However, here the external handman can claim for the loss that has been caused to him from the company, which may be disbursed through the insurance company. So, and that this Mr. Z, the handman, can be considered as the claimant and not the insured. Why? Because he's actually a third party. So he has just been visiting the company as an external handman. So now he can claim it from the company and the amount will be disbursed through the insurance company. That's an interesting clause normally in automobile insurance, that is the omnibus clause. Now, omnibus provision may be normally found in standard, that is the normal automobile or vehicle liability policies that extends coverage even to persons were not mentioned in the policy. Now, the omnibus clause applies to individuals who are authorized to use a vehicle that is covered under the insurance, a valid insurance policy. Now, what is important here, or what gains prominence here, is that the person is permitted to drive the vehicle under a valid permission or authorization that is sought from the owner. So, this is the omnibus clause where the person who is seeking insurance or for the, the loss that has been caused. It's not necessary that the person, uh, you know, has actually, you know, uh, uh, possesses, does actually possess a valid insurance policy, but it would suffice that he's driving the vehicle with the valid permission or authorization that he or she has sought from the owner. So the individuals, the question here is it applies to individuals who are authorized to use the vehicle and the vehicle is covered under a valid insurance policy authorized to use the vehicle. I think you can use this, uh, you know, as a substantiation for your assignments that is given to you, the omnibus clause. I'm repeating, you have an assignment there that is given to you. So this clause also would help you in, you know, substantiating your answer. That is, omnibus provision may be normally found in a standard automobile or vehicle liability policies that extends coverage even to persons not mentioned in the policy. And the omnibus clause applies to individuals who are authorized to use a vehicle that is covered under a valid insurance policy. And what is important here is that the person is permitted to drive the vehicle under a valid permission or authorization sought from the owner. Next is insurer. So free dictionary defines insurer as a person or a company offering insurance policies in return for premiums. In short, or simply speaking, the insurance company is the insurer. So insurance, insurance of PDA def, defines insurance insurer as an insurer is a party that agrees to compensate people, companies, or other organizations for specific losses you know, a financial loss would include the destruction of a home due to a fire or a vehicle to an accident. Any event that would put the client in a lesser financial state that before the event occurred, the insurance company is the insurer, the purchaser of the insurance would be the insured. What are the duties of the insurer? That is the insurance company. Of course, pay, you know, payment on time or in dispersal of the claim on time, indemnifying the losses of the insurance policy as per the, you know, the documents that has been solicited by the insurance company and upon you know, uh, the, the timely submission of the relevant documents that are required uh, to, you know, to honor the claim. Next is duty to defend as per the legal costs of an insured in case of a litigation. Duty to defend also this could be connected to the to subrogation. However, we learn this as, as, as uh, you know, as a distinct aspect. Duty to defend or pay the legal costs of an insured in case of a uh, litigation. Example: Mr. A has purchased a professional liability insurance and got his cosmetology clinic covered. So A covered, 
And then ACE microderma abrasion treatment fails on a 32-year-old Miss B. And a face immediately developed, you know, postular pimples and rashes that never got healed for six months despite several, you know, treatments and administration of antibiotics. Miss B's friend, who is a lawyer, advised her to file a case against the cosmetology clinic and Mr. A for professional negligence. So in this case, Mr. A's insurer will be obligated to defend Mr. A in the civil action alleging negligence. So, so you see here, Mr. A is actually the cosmetologist who is, you know, who is the holder of a particular insurance policy under which he has covered the cosmetology clinic and it's a professional, in, uh, you know, professional liability insurance. This guy, Mr. A, you, you know, he ends up uh, in a case of negligence, which has costed his patient, uh, you know, her skin. So the, the patient actually, she goes ahead on the advice of a friend who's a lawyer, she files a case. Now, Mr. A's insurance company now will be obligated to defend Mr. A by virtue of he holding the professional liability insurance in the civil action alleging negligence. Next is subrogation. Now this principle is corollary to the concept of indemnity where in the insurance company, this you also learned in the first chapter under the principles of you know, insurance. Now this principle of subrogation is corollary of indemnity wherein the insurance company or the insurer takes over the insured's right by the insurer. In simple terms, when the insurance company disburses the amount to the insured and the insured tries to make a claim elsewhere, for instance, through the court of law, then in such a situation, the amount of claim will be subrogated to the insurance company or the insurer to the extent of the amount that is disbursed to the insured under the relevant insurance scheme. The insurer on obtaining the consent of the insured can pursue the party that caused an insurance loss damage to the insured in order to recover the amount that is paid in the claim. Sometimes they need not have the consent of the insured always. Uh, especially when there is a, you know, a litigation that is involved there and the, um, the, um, the amount of insurance is already disbursed to the insured. So now the, the, you know, it is now subrogated to the insurance company or to the insurer. So it's not always required that the consent be obtained. It depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case. Now, do, but by and large, they say that you know, consent has to be obtained and once the insured gives uh, the consent, they can go ahead and, you know, recover the amount that is paid uh, in the claim to the insured by the insurer. So duty to settle claim as per the terms mentioned in the insurance contract, next is protect the privacy of the insured and the beneficiary because we know that in the pursuit of purchasing insurance, what happens is they solicit important documents, personal documents, ID documents. So they, they are in possession of all, you know, you know, confidential personal information, including, you know, health reports and so on. So it's a duty to protect privacy of an individual or the insurance policy holder or the insured there. Next is to ascertain the risk at the time of purchasing the policy and then assess the damage at the time of settling the claim, depending upon the type of policy through their team of underwriters. So of course, they ascertain the risk as well as assess the damage. And what are the rights of the insurer that is the insurance company? One, the first right is, of course, it's not necessary they honor every claim because it depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case. It depends whether the insured has divulged all information that, that is required and that has been sought validly or legitimately sought by the insurance company. Next is upon intimating the insured or the beneficiary regarding the course of investigation, as per the procedure established by law, the insured is expected to come and you know immediately give all those relevant documents to the to the insurer or to the insurance company. So now, yet another thing is is the insurer also shall have the right to defer payment or to postpone payment or benefit under the insurance scheme until the insured provides all relevant documents that is solicited. Example: police reports in case of accident claims. Then the insurance insurer has got the right to defer payment also in case of pending litigation, civil or criminal, or under the orders of the court. He'll have to act under the orders of the court. Next is right not to indemnify in case a party of the insured has already been indemnified. Right 
to avoid duplication of process and payments. The right to deny disbursal of payments and of canceling the policy in case of fraud, misrepresentation, concealing of material facts, failure to pay premium, or even breach of insurance contract. So these are some of the rights of the insurer. However, the rights and duties of the insurer will be elaborated in a valid insurance policy contract. So to understand on a case-to-case -case basis, the rights and duties or scope of the insurance policy, one has to go through the insurance policy contract and then study the scope, especially the insurance clause, which is the heart of the insurance contract. So that's all for today. For the next class, we'll be moving further and studying the other chapters. We move on to chapter five. And uh, uh, of course, I'll be uh, you know checking your attendance for the day and uh, submit your assignments. And if you have any questions, you're free to ask me. That's all for today. Thank you.